Thank you. Thanks. I like it how like people always clap before us, but you guys don't know what I'm going to say up here. You might, you might hate it, but it's just like, I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt and, <laughs> and clap. So I, I do appreciate that. Uh, I want to start out by saying that, that life is really weird. Um, I, I think it's funny that we get together in this big group in public with a bunch of people we don't know, and we, like, we act this sort of like regular way that we call normal. But like, when you get around the people that you actually know, like your, your family and your close friends, like, how do you act? Weird. Like, really weird. Like, the kind of inside jokes that people have with each other. Like, with the ways that I've acted in front of other. If I did that right now, can you imagine how awkward that would be? But that's just the way we are. But for some reason, we call this normal. So I, I just wanted to point that out. And it has nothing to do with my speech. Uh, but I just, oh, yeah, I wanted to say that. So sorry, Thane, Mr. Glenn gave me the, the, the slot for this speech. But it's, it's just all downhill from here. OK, what a, <laughs> second point is there are so many things I could do to make this so awkward right now. Uh, like, there, even for, like, okay, if I get really nervous and, like, forget my speech or what do I, or if I say some joke and it just falls really flat, but let's think beyond that. Like, if I tripped when I was up here or, like, I had some Freudian slip that was really embarrassing. Anyway, I'm not going to do that stuff, but it's just, it's worth thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> Point number three, we're, we're all very different people, but I, I think when it comes to the game of life, we're all sort of playing the same game. Uh, what I mean is that the basic program that we run it sort of goes like this, okay, like I'm walking around, I've got stuff i got to do today. Okay, I'm at Starbucks and okay, there's a sign and there's numbers, I can read the numbers. Man, it totally seems like, I never thought about it, but it seems like all my friends just call each other more often than they call me, you know? It's like always been like that. Yeah, dude, when we're going out to do something fun, like I'm the last guy that they call. Now, okay, well, maybe I just got to like switch up my style, you know? Like if I looked cooler, you know, I'm, okay, I'm going to drive to Zumias, I'm going to get like this hat and put it on crooked, and like, and they're going to think I'm like spontaneous and fun, and they're going to, oh, my midterms, those are next week, and I have not done any studying, I'm totally unprepared, I forgot about those, man, I don't have time to go to Zumias now, but I want to be cool, I don't, who cares about the mid, I don't have time to do both of them. So, so the program that we run is we try to arrange our lives so that, so that we'll be happy. And we're going about our day, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this thing pops into our head, and we call it a thought. And it's like a little a voice speaks a sentence in your mind about some issue, you know, in your life. And so you, oh, that's there, I better focus on this issue. And so more thoughts begin to pour in about that issue, and then it begins to kick up some emotion surrounding it. And if it's negative emotion, we say, oh, well, that issue is a problem. I need to fix that. I need to do whatever these thoughts are saying. Fix that issue. And if I fix it, then I'll start to get happy thoughts and happy feelings around it. So I'll be happy, right? So all I need to do to be happy is to fix that issue. And I need to fix all these other issues and I'll be happy, right? That's what we do, isn't it? So how's that working out for you? <laughs> right? Since I'm already up here and I have the floor, I'm just going to toss the idea out that in life, it's actually not about the issues. It's about the emotions that underlie them. Like that anxiety isn't actually a prompt to get you to deal with that specific issue. In a way, it's got nothing to do with that particular issue. You know, I just want to toss out the idea, how does it sound that maybe there's something in your mental landscape that is intentionally trying to generate suffering? And those particular thoughts and feelings there aren't there for your sake. Your negative emotions aren't there for your sake. They're there for its sake because it kind of feeds off of them. I call it, you know, the fear eater. Okay, so you don't believe me, I know. Um, but think about this. You got something coming up like, oh, you got a test. I got to study for this test. It's something you're stressing about. Long time, lots of stress. And compare that with the actual amount of relief and satisfaction you get when, when you hit that test and you, you do it well and you pass. You know? So you pass the test and just notice how quickly that same fear and anxiety latches onto some new issue. Like in two days, I have something else. You know, check it out. It's the exact same feeling. The, the feelings actually survive the death of the issue. So <laughs> is, it, is it about the issues or is it about the feelings? If it was really about the issues, I mean, you would get this, the, the exact same amount of stress you had leading up to the thing. You'd get relief and satisfaction coming down from the thing, right? Because that thing was so important, right, to, to warrant all that stress because because the stress really is what it claims to be, right? You know, it's a useful, legitimate concern about this issue in your life, and it's a tool to get you to work on that issue, and it's the issue that's really the problem, right? Or is it, you know? Is that issue just like the other hand in the magic trick so that you won't notice you're getting fed all this anxiety and all this fear that really doesn't have any business being there in your life? 
You know, it's not about the issues, it's about the emotions. So w what's our current strategy for, for solving unhappiness, you know? It's to fix all the issues. Fix all the issues, right? <laughs> okay, as soon as I get my, you know, as soon as I get that new car, as soon as my family understands this, as soon as the lights turn back on, then I'll be happy. <laughs> You know, I fi fix it oh, as soon as I get, as soon as I'm this popular, as soon as I get this relationship, then I'll be happy. There's always going to be issues, right? And the, it's not the issues that generate that, that negative emotion in the first place. It's the fear eater that generates it because it's hungry. You can take a tally of this yourself. You've got something that's coming up and you're afraid of it, right? Okay, how is it ever that the thing you're afraid of actually feels like what you thought it would feel like? You know, so where's that imagination <coughs> coming from? You know, and right now I'm sure that you're thinking, okay, I don't believe anything that he's saying right now, um, which is fine. And I, can't, I definitely can't tell you how to think about your own conscious experience, but let me just throw some stuff out there and, and see where it hits. Um, memory. So we've got, we've got this thing we call memory, and it's great, and it like serves these useful functions, you know, and like somebody can be like, hey, dude, do you remember this? And you can be like, you, go, you sort of like go into your memory vault, you know, like, oh yeah, I remember that, that was rad. Um, or, or, you know, you can, but, but every once in a while, or a lot, memories just pop into your head without you asking for them. So what's up with that? D does your memory vault just like leak and you, you just get a little drip <laughs> in your mind? I would argue that it's a, it's a separate phenomenon. If it's in your conscious, memories are in the memory vault. If it's in your consciousness, somebody went back there to get it, you know, but why would this not you go back there? I mean, you have an obvious reason for having your memories getting them when you need them. You gotta reminisce with somebody or you gotta figure out where you left your keys, you know? But why, why is this other, this not you, that put that in there? Well, I think that your memories are valuable for another reason, for the emotional response that they can get out of you, right? So you think you're interacting with your past on a daily basis, but why do specific memories pop up when they do? You know, is it like your neurons are just like piled on top of each other and finally they just topple like into your your conscious space, like that's too, or some, cor some cortex is just like full and that comes out because, because that's the right time for you to process it or something. So really, okay, you're writing the paper, tomorrow morning it's due, that's definitely the right time to process again. The, oh yeah, you remember like in middle school that dude threw my backpack down the stairs and everyone thought it was like so funny? Well, he's not funny, he sucks, you know? <laughs> like that, you need to have a talk with your brain about efficiency, you know? Why is that particular memory there? then I would argue that the majority of, or at least a very high percentage of the mental processes that we run into are actually traps to get us into these negative emotions. You just got to study the extremes, dude. That's how scientists are doing it. That's why you get like miles and miles of these subterranean tunnels, this huge 17 mile long thing. They shoot these little electrons around like as fast as possible, smash into each other, super expensive, 20 trillion dollars. And that's all just so we understand like what's really up with this piece of wood. You know, what, what, what is this stage? Why does life look? They study the extremes to find out about normal. And we can do the same thing in the mind with what we, would, what, what we label as mental illness, right? You have, you have psychotics who have these voices that yell at them all day and they say, you're no good. Nobody likes you. The world would be better off if you weren't here. That guy's out to get you. You can't do anything right. And we call that a disease. Well, that person needs to be cured. We definitely don't say that that's healthy. We definitely don't say follow those voices, right? But uh, has anybody ever had thoughts with similar content in them, right? It's just the volume is turned down, right? Anorexics, in extreme cases, they starve themselves to the point of which their lives are in danger. But they can't tell that they're not fat. They, look, they have a mirror and they can't tell. So when you're like looking in the mirror and you're like, oh yeah, I'm just like a little bit homely, uh, I just don't look very good. So are you, are you you're totally sure that, that you're so in touch with reality when we've seen that the human mind can be that, that warped. Uh, you get uh, erotomaniacs who think that they, they believe us, that there's a celebrity that's their soulmate. And this celebrity like in their interviews like folds their hands like this and that means I secretly love you, you know? Uh, and we know, is that, is that legit? We all, we laugh at that because that's, but, but when you, 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 so you break up with somebody and all, and you, you know, your friends and family are like, yeah, you, you need to move on. And the person's like moving on, but you're just like, but we were, oh, we were so great. I just can't move. Are you sure that you were really that compatible that you can tell, but these people can't, you know, or, um, or this one person that you're like trying to convince, you know, this person, they just got to like me. You try to get them to like you. They don't like you. You know, like, sorry, sorry, no, but, but you're just convinced this person's going to complete me. Are you, are you sure that you're that perceptive? 
You know? Can we really take these extremes of the mental illness and just place ourselves in these totally, like we know what's going on. It makes sense that we think, but it's all the same phenomena, you know, on different levels. And look at these mental illnesses. There's such a wide variety of phenomena and such a wide variety of ways they interact with someone. But what's the constant with all those? You know? It's misery. Why aren't there euphoric mental illnesses? Why doesn't the brain misfire in the other direction? You just are just unstoppably happy, you know, uh, or nearly to the extent that it does with these mental illnesses, you know, just worth thinking about. Maybe the departments are all kind of organized, the, the fear eaters that work on you are organized, just like the CEO of the dudes who go and genetically modify, <clears throat> you guys can come in in the back if you want, I won't be offended or anything, the CEO of the company that goes and genetically modifies foods, right, he goes and gets appointed to the FDA, and he passes a bunch of laws that favor genetically modified foods. Then he goes back and he works for them, right? That's how corruption works. It's because it's efficient. So what if there's an intent behind the forces that get you to take something wrong, like, oh, somebody said that, they meant that, and you take it wrong, you take it personally. Then we move over and we start to go through this process, which is the process of we're going to argue with this person in our own minds, okay? And I, we've all, I, I'm sure we've all been through this process. And what, what does the process actually accomplish? So you're, you're there, oh yeah, like I said, I was this in front of everyone. Oh yeah, dude. Well, did you ever think about how you're this? Bro? And then like you, you like you go over it and you finally come up with like the perfect put down and you say it to them. What happens? You say it to them in your head and then you're like, ah, that's great. I did it. Yeah, yeah. And the next time you see the person, you're like, got you, dude. You know? <laughs> no. No, not at all. The only function it performs is that you're anxious all day thinking about this person. And when you actually do see them, you're more anxious because you've been thinking about them all day. So you just like, act weird around them. And that actually does damage to your relationship. And bam, that's a three for one deal. You know, all because the, like, the Federal Bureau of getting you to take things wrong and the Department of Internal Argumentation for False Reasons and the <laughs> Relationship Destruction Association, they all know each other. These guys, they go and play golf together, you know? <laughs> Like, maybe, maybe there's the, the fear eaters that work on your life are more organized than you think they are, okay? Maybe your mind puts you in these little pens of whatever your thing is, you know, self-esteem issues, boredom, worry, fear, I'm not good enough, for the same reason that a farmer puts a cow in a little pen, you know? Because it's easier to get the milk, right? But the fear eaters don't drink milk. They drink you having a crappy day. Think about it, man. If I came up to you and I was like, hey, and I just started to criticize your value as a human being and criticize your accomplishments and I brought up humiliating memories and then I brought up embarrassing memories and painful memories over and over again and I was like, oh yeah, you got a test tomorrow. You have a test tomorrow. You got a test. I think that you would punch me in the face, <laughs> right? So, so does it make any sense that our own minds can get away with, with doing the, the same thing to us? So whatever. Those are just some thoughts. Read Swedenborg. Thank you very much. <laughs>